Hello and welcome to this very special online exclusive panel discussion when worlds collide with the cast and creatives of His Dark Materials, hosted by yours truly, Ali Plum, and presented by BFI and Radio Times Television Festival. His Dark Materials, of course, is returning to screen soon, and I am over the moon to be joined by some of the key cast and creative minds behind this adaptation of Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials novels. We rejoin Lyra Balacqua, who, distraught over the death of her best friend Roger, follows Lord Azriel, her father, into the unknown after he opens a bridge to a new world. We find Lyra in the strange city of Chittagatsi, where she meets Will, who is also running from a troubled past. Please let me introduce you to our panel today. There's executive producer, Jane Tranter, writer, Jack Thorne, Lyra herself, Daphne Keane, our Will, Amir Wilson, Mary Malone, that's Simone Kirby, and Lord Boreal himself, Arian Bakari. Welcome, everyone. Okay, so let's ask the big question. Where were we at the end of series one, and where are we heading at the beginning of series two? So uh, at the end of season one, uh, Lyra and Pan were uh, walking through a hole through the worlds that her father had created. She had lost her best friend and she was going in search of a thing called dust that has been teased throughout season one. In season two, Lyra finds herself in a completely different world, grieving for her best friend and, and wanting to find out what dust is. Because Lara believes that if grown-ups think that dust is a bad thing, it's probably a good thing. And we find her in this strange world called Chittagatsi, and there she meets Will, who we've seen set up in our world in season one, and who we see disappear through a window in our world following a cat. That's as crazy as it is. <laughs> Uh, Jack, could you tell us a little bit about uh, how you tackled uh, the second book in your adaptation and what new characters you brought uh, onto the screen? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing adapting Philip Pullman because his work is so dense and exciting. Um, with this one, um, you, you, you sort of want to see the, the soul of the book and you sort of want to ask the question, how can you bring that soul of the book out? And for us, the main question, the thing that we were focusing on beyond anything else was that question of trust. So Lyra has trusted people all her life. She has always been able to form relationships with people very, very quickly. And then slowly through series one, we've seen that trust erode as she, as she um, uh, learned to mistrust Ms. Coul Mrs. Coulter. She learned that Mrs. Coulter wasn't her mother, uh, was her mother, and all, all these questions started to, and then at the end of series one, uh, a man she admired, the grown-up she admired more than anyone else alive, her uncle, uh, she discovered was her father, and then her father committed a heinous act. And she's now got to learn how to uh, grow that trust again. And to help her in that, she uh, has um, come across uh, Will. And Will is someone that has never trusted easily. Um, he was, uh, one of the things I most love about Philip's work is that the hero he found from our world was a teenage carer. And, uh, and, with, his, and with his mother, he has learned to mistrust the world. And, and now these two uh, individuals have got to find a way of growing together uh, and, and growing the bonds and the confidence uh, that will allow them to um, fulfill their destiny. Sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. It's just, I've never seen a demon before. To me, demon means something evil. Uh, thanks. You're not from here, are you? From this world. Me neither. How did you get here? I crossed through a window. But my father made. You? Uh, I uh, followed a cat through a hole in the air. It sounds mad. <laughs> so there are three worlds and two windows, all connected to here. Look, I know this world doesn't make sense. And I don't know whether I'm odd for not having a demon or you're odd for having one. But maybe we could look around together. The three of us. That's the best idea I've heard all day.
Daphne, how do you begin to tackle where Lyra's at at the beginning of this? Because to say it's complicated is to maybe not have the right word. Well, you start at this point where she's quite literally in a different world. She knows nothing. We find her in the middle of the mountains alone with just Pan. She can't trust the lithiometer anymore. She can't, she can't trust anyone. Her only family, which was basically Roger, is now gone. And so we find her in this really, really horrible place. She's grieving for Roger and she stumbles across Will, who she doesn't trust because as Jack said, it's impossible to trust anyone anymore. And I think season two is all about Will and Lyra having to open up again and figure out who they can open up to and who they can't and who they can't trust and who they can't and figuring out that basically they have got each other's backs and that in this crazy world of result materials no one else has their back except for both of them and yeah it was really it's all about it's a very it's a friendship story it's about these two people getting to know each other and care for each other is there a certain amount of fun in playing with the fact that your character doesn't know all these things we take for granted. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I had so many fun scenes where I had to like pretend I didn't know what some like medical things were and where I didn't know what phones were, a cinema scene. It was, it was really crazy. It was really fun. I had to like go into Oxford and pretend things were like really exciting when it's just a fire, you know. You hungry? Amazing on that. If you have on it, Snow Bob. So you're a kitchen boy then? What? New world, you're a kitchen boy. No. What's in this? Egg. guessing you don't use cutlery in your world either. Very funny. It's good. The omelette. Does Pan need to eat too? Some cheese or...? No. no. He's a demon. Uh, but thank you for the offer. <laughs> I've never had to explain a demon before. It's a part of me. He's me and I'm him, I guess. You'll soon understand. How long have you been here? A couple of days. You? Three days. I was thinking. Maybe we're better off sticking together from now on. You want me to stay? To set up camp here? meant we should explore together. I didn't mean you should move in. Probably easier though, isn't it? Now that we're sticking together. So Amma, you join the show and you've essentially got to very quickly become fast friends with Daphne. What's the trick? If you want to become good mates with Daphne, is it, <laughs> where do you go, what do you do? Well, Daphne hates me, so I don't know how they're to go. <laughs> I'm joking, I'm joking. Um, I don't know what to say. Um, I think, ooh. Definitely go rock climbing. We, were, we got to do that a lot. Um, weekly, we'd go rock climbing. I think that was a good way to um, get to know each other. And me and Daphne lived like a five minute walk away from each other. And um, next to us was this um, Butte Park, which is like this huge park in Cardiff. And it was really lovely. We got to go on walks there daily. And um, yeah, it was, it was good. That's how we kind of got to know each other. Amo, what was it like finding that fine line, walking that fine line of reacting to the wonder of Chittagatse? Was it quite easy considering the incredible sets that you had surrounding you? Yeah, um, I think the sets definitely helped me um, kind of visualise it and kind of be there in, in the moment. Um, I mean, when it comes to actually like walking through the portals and stuff, it's harder because like I'm kind of just, as I said before, just looking at a bush and walk straight into a bush and I kind of, they just had a light on my face and I had to pretend I was looking at some crazy world and I was just looking at a bunch of leaves. Um, but no, it was really good. And the sets, I kind of, they kind of made it so that you could kind of shoot 
360 and kind of not have to shoot onto a green screen, which kind of, it was, it really helped, yeah. This is a question for all the actors, actually. I was wondering, when you're shooting His Dark Materials, are there particular notes you get from the director, from the writer, from the producers that you're never going to forget because they're so particular <laughs> to His Dark Materials? Oh, that's a hard question. Um... Yes. Well, no, let's moan after that. <laughs> I don't think I don't think we got any any particular character notes. I think yeah, because no, we had the books to work from. I mean, that's that's a lot of <laughs> source material. There's always been supplies there to characters. work from all the time, so you kind of draw from that for your character, yeah. don't you? So it's really no. You, I guess, there's little tiny things you have to remember that you've always got a demon. You know, there's little things like your snake's going to pop out of your um, your sleeve. <laughs> That was quite interesting. Your snake is coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, I think so, we did have like a very specific note, especially Arian and I, because we had demons. It was like, do not touch the demon at any point. Yeah, so do not touch it. Your instinct would be like, oh, it's my soul. And they'd be like, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So that was probably it was the only thing we had. Like, there do was not one time in Bruce and myself where I, I kept slamming the tail of the monkey inside the, the, the door. <laughs> that was really bad. I kept getting told off about that. I kept doing it over and over again. Watch out for the monkey. So. Um, I got, um, Amir, don't play with the knife. Amir, stop playing with the knife. That's kind of, that's all I got really. Um, yeah. I, don't run with scissors. And don't run with scissors. Yeah. Don't play with Don't play with knife. Uh, Ari, no, I was wondering if there was a particular real life personality or character that you're channeling when you're being this sinister Lord Boreal. <laughs> sinister Lord Boreal. No, myself. Yes, I, myself. No, I, I, I think more, I kind of, kind of drew more about acting for my own demon, really. I was like, I was really interested. In my, my drama school, we used to do this thing called animal exercise. And the whole thing was to try and draw a character from an animal. And, because we had this chance of playing with a demon and my demon was a snake, I kept thinking, well, if I use that as a character external thing, then I'll get this kind of stillness, hypnotic stare, quite sinister, speak really quietly, keep it that the only time he ever does lose it is when he pounces. And mm. so you, you kind of have this person who's contained and these emotions completely like torn up inside himself. So yeah, it's always about the snake really. Always about the snake. <laughs> Always about the snake. End of scene. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> you interested in skulls? Mm -hmm. Did you know that people still do that? Drill holes in their heads. They must be lunatics. There's a name for it. I forgot what it's called. Trepanning. Are you a student in Oxford? No, it says it there. <laughs> well, I wish I knew so much at your age. Charles. Lizzie. I'm a collector. I've donated various items to this place. Listen, um, if you ever want to know more about these artifacts. Thanks. Nice to meet you, Lizzie. Simone, could you tell us a little bit about your character and her reaction to meeting Lyra for the first time? Obviously, Mary Malone is studying dark matter at Oxford University. But what do you think is going through her head when she first discovers the, even the concept of Lyra? Well, it's great because when Lyra comes in, she, Mary's already in the middle of her own disaster because her funding has been taken away. And it's always quite nice to meet a character who's distracted because they've got something else going on. Mm -hmm. um, so when Lyra comes in, I think, first of all, it's unusual to see a child wandering around a college. But also, as, as Daphne said earlier, like the worst things have happened to her. And she's in this really, really vulnerable place. And it's quite fortunate for her that the alethiometer has led her to an, a good grown up, <laughs> somebody who has empathy. Um, and and her, her world just gets turned upside down really, really quickly after she meets Lyra. Hi. 
Uh, can you please tell me where the physicist is? Well, what kind of physicist are you after? Well, I do. You're a scholar. <laughs> Believe it or not, I am, yeah. W what were you doing? Oh, I'm watching, uh, there's a nest of fledglings in the drain. Wrens. They come back every year. Sorry, you were? Lara Silverton. Mary Malone. You're not a student, are you? Can you please tell me about dust? Dust? What do you mean? Well, we call it dust in my world. Or we also call it Rusikov particles. You ever heard of them? In your world, in your school, you mean? No. We're not allowed to study dust because the Magisterium thinks it's original sin. They take children to the north, and now there's an opening. And my father is... I'm saying it all wrong. I didn't think it would be this difficult. I'm not sure I'm who you're looking for, Lyra. Yes. Yes, you are. I know you are. Is there someone I can call to help your parents, or...? No. This matters. This matters so much. You see, my friend was killed because of dust. I've traveled so far. I found myself here. And Jordan's gone. And I don't know where to go. I need to find out about dust because if I don't find out about dust, it will be for nothing. Roger's death will be for nothing. I miss him so much. I'm sorry about your friend. I need you to tell me about the particles you study. Had a really interesting thing. Every time we kept going into Mary, Mary Malone's world, it's like these two worlds crossing over. It's like they're so strange acting with, with like our kind of old school way of acting. And then yeah. like this. <laughs> I remember the first time we did a scene together, we were like, uh, I want to do what you're doing. I just want to be a little bit more naturalistic. You were like, <laughs> uh, Yeah, because it is, it is, you know, because myself and, and Robin, who plays Oliver, you yeah. know, we're just doing all these scenes about funding and, uh, <laughs> And then suddenly, kind of like. <laughs> yeah, suddenly Lyra or Boreal or like the, the acting has to be quite heightened because they come from yeah. this world where the stakes are huge mm -hmm. and Aww. Mary's like oh my funding <laughs> so it's very <laughs> different styles it of acting. So different, yeah. um, can we talk a little bit about the uh, witch queen uh, because I've always wanted to ask can we talk a little bit about the witch queen? <laughs> Two witch queens! I do beg your pardon you're absolutely right the witch queens. Were you talking to someone in the room then? I beg your pardon. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the other witch queen? Do you mind? <laughs> I've got a witch queen right here. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> yeah, could you, I mean, I suppose I'm specifically re referring to Ruta. Um, what can you tell us about her and expanding that character um, as you conceived her? It's interesting because a actually, Ruta Scurdy was in. Um, in my first draft of episode two of series one. So we, we've, we'd always had Ruta in our heads, in the back of our heads as a character that we really wanted to explore because of her relationship with Asriel and because of what she'd do to Serafina uh, and what she'd challenge about Serafina. Um, one of the wonderful things about series two is that I'm not writing on my own, um, that we've got an incredible writing team and um, and our, our writing team, one, one of their central focuses were the witches um, and, and doing justice to them. And, and so a story that started quite small grew and grew and grew. We had these incredible meetings where, where you know, these huge things were being discussed about what we could do to them and what we could challenge about them in order to, in order to really make them feel like they're real parts of the world. Um, and, 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 and I can take very little credit for, for, for where the story goes. Um, uh, that it, 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 it's all the work of uh, Francesca, Namsi, Lydia and, and Sarah, that, that they really did, did make that story flower. Um, uh, and I love Ruta Scardi very, very much. Looks amazing as well. Can we yes. talk a little bit about um, the submarines? What was it like bringing them to life? 
Uh, so the submarines are actually um, the idea of Joel Collins. Um, so in season one, we see the Magisterium on airships, um, which is their sort of their established uh, mode of travel. Um, and Joel thought that actually in, 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 for the opening of season two, uh, we could ramp that up a bit. Um, and so he created um, the interior of what's a kind of like um, sort of uh, 1960s-esque type interior of submarine um, with the idea that the Magisterium, having heard these rumours that Azrael had um, ripped a hole through the sky, that they fast track it up north in a submarine um, to keep themselves safe because they're not really very certain what it is they're going to be facing. Um, and, uh, and it creates just a very um, brooding atmosphere for these group of men to sit around discussing how they are going to hide from the rest of the world. The fact that Azrael's blown a hole in the landscape and how they're going to lie and say it's not really there or try and cover it up. Um, and it felt giving them in this enclosed space was a, a very good metaphor for these men in this tiny dark bubble. Amir and Daphne, do you mind talking a little bit more about how one day there wasn't a Chittagatse and then suddenly in a car park near where you were working, there was a Chittagatse? How did that feel? What was it like exploring it for the first time? Was there a, a little amount of time that you were allowed to just go and explore it for yourself? Yeah, there was a day where before we started filming, we got to go into the set and just kind of just look about, see what it was like. Um, and yeah, it was cool. For me, it was different because obviously I wasn't there for like the main shooting of season one. So for me, it was kind of just like the trailers were never there for me. I wasn't obviously there. Um, but it was, it was just, it was crazy. It was the fact I'd never seen like a town been built like that. And it, it just, it was so, I couldn't comprehend it at first. For me, it was really weird because that was literally where my trailer was one year. So I went, I, remember, I saw Chitagatsi first because I went to my trailer and then I was like, why is there a town like where my trailer is? <laughs> <laughs> my driver was like, oh, sorry, wrong way. And then he took me to my actual trailer and I was like, wait, can I see that? And they said, no, we're going to take you on a tour. And then we got taken on a tour with tons of other kids who were playing like Chitagatsi kids. So it, it was just basically me and Amir walking with like four security guys and hordes of like seven-year-old children around <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> what is wearing high-vis vests and, and hats yeah. and stuff <laughs> and yeah it was really weird because it was literally what you said for me i went to spain and then i came back and there was like this entire town and it was crazy because it was so realistic like it had so much detail like you went inside shops and it actually had things the shops had the products they were selling and it was just incredible to see like that suddenly for me without seeing the process of it. I just, it wasn't there and then it was, and it was just incredible. Yeah. And I mean, it, was that eerie, just, it was quite yeah. eerie to um, film on it as well, wasn't it? It was just like quite a, even when you walked, it had that atmosphere, which just yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. it kind of had its own atmosphere, its own world compared to all the other sets really. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I mean, definitely have marked our names on the wall, on one of the oh, walls. Really? Where did you do that? Yeah, um, yeah, it was, like, yeah. No, we um, Joe, we were on set and um, we had time between takes, and Daphne's like, "I'm here, come here, come here." I'm like, "What?" And she's like, "Look," and then she like carved her initials into the wall, and I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna do this as well." So there's a bit where it says A W and D K. Oh, Trying to find that. Oh, Hopefully, oh. you can see it in the series. I love the idea that somewhere, like Simone says, there's a tag of Amir and Daphne, <laughs> yeah. like properly just in your face, spray yeah. paint. <laughs> <laughs> can't film on that corner anymore. <laughs> Something's <laughs> happened. The spectres have done something. I don't know what. <laughs> They're uh, in your room again. <laughs> Will Parry. Finally, someone else to talk to. That's Pan. And where's your demon? How's it talking? He does know not to touch me, right? That's a talking animal. No, it's not a talking animal. That's my demon. Your what? You don't have a demon. I can't see one. That's impossible. You're talking about. No. Come on, Pan. 
and Iris Silverton. Wait. Amir, um, can we talk a bit more about how you've had to come to terms with acting alongside with demons in a way that everyone else is a little bit more like, oh yeah, no big problem. It's a demon. The demons are cool. Um, obviously, I don't have a demon, um, but it kind of, I was, I would love seeing it happen. I kind of got, I don't really have much scenes directly with Pan. There's one nice scene where um, Lyra's asleep and Pan and Will have this conversation about Lyra. And um, filming that, that was kind of the first time I got to properly interact with just me and, and a puppet. And it was, it was really cool. The puppeteers, they, they make it so realistic and it really, it's, it's so, it's so useful. Um, and when you see it, how it looks in the end, actually at film school, we were learning about VFX and I used the example of the golden monkey as part of my project, because obviously they have like the puppet and then you kind of get to see how it progresses to what it finally looks like. Um, I just think it's amazing. I love that you used in your school report yeah, the yeah, show yeah. that you were in. <laughs> that's, so, that's actually so cool, isn't it? I hope yeah. you got an A. If you didn't get an A, a there is no <laughs> justice. I hope so, I hope so, I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> He's got it wrong. It's completely wrong. What are you talking about? <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> what a terrible example. Um, <laughs> that would be awkward. Well, for, you, okay. for you guys that obviously, um, I'm sorry, Simone, but everyone that was involved in the first series, what's it been like um, reacting to the fan interaction and people responding to the first series and the excitement that's building for the second one? Um, it, it feels great to know that the fans like it so much. Um, and I just yeah, I can't wait for everyone to see the second series and what, what, what's in store for that. It's been it's been brilliant because it's one of the things you know these books are are really treasured and um they're a very very they're a broad read and they're a really deep read mm -hmm. and the fans know lots about the books and um we we needed to take the fans with us and then introduce people who perhaps have not yet read the books to them through our television adaptation and actually seeing people um, seeing the fans react to the season and seeing them work out what we were doing, in particular, the kind of um, the breadcrumb trail we led to the introduction of Will in season one that we lent into via having Boreal begin to cross through the worlds. And there was a sense of what are they doing? What are they doing? Um, and then we saw how it led to Will and there was kind of like, oh, that's really good. And the, the, the fans of his adult materials are brilliant. Um, they have, you know, they're good hearts and lively minds and it's been um, a great relief and uh, an enormous pleasure to, to Look, see them react. And also it's the thing is of all the new fans of people who've like just watched the series and gone, wow, the book is so amazing. And they go off and read the books and they're even more intrigued to find out what the next season's like. I mean, people do come up to me and say to me, if I hadn't seen the series, I definitely wouldn't have read the book. And so yeah. to me, that's amazing. I think that's what's really great about it is that they feel as if it's so entrenched in this world now and they want to talk about it in that way. And they feel as if all the themes about things they're going through at this moment in their life. So it's like, I think it's brilliant for that. I, I, I'm quite... I'm going to get loads of loads of people to send me loads of emails or text messages about it. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is great. So I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you all so much for uh, joining me, joining us for this today. It's Thank been you. such a pleasure. Um, Simone, Jack, Amir, Ari and Jane, and of course, Daphne. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Yeah. Bye. 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 The BFI and Radio Times would like to thank everybody who made this happen, especially everyone at BBC, HBO, Bad Wolf and Ian Johnson PR.